go. Good morning. So, authentication. I hope everybody had a nice weekend. And uh, this week, we'll do a couple of things. Uh, the first three quarters of the week is going to be talking about authentication. And um, we're going to see a couple of ways of doing that. So if you look on the side here, we're going to have an introduction today. And then tomorrow is going to be sessions and cookies. And then something called JSON with tokens. And then a little bit of testing and deployment at the end. So questions? There's a question thread. Please open it. Have it on the side there, ready to go. So what are we doing this week? We get an introduction to the world of authentication, not authorization, but we'll mention what they are. And you'll see how to roll a basic username and password authentication system. Doesn't mean that that's what you're going to be doing that on your job. Uh, most companies will have a service for that, or maybe they already have that in place. But it's a good idea for you to understand how that works, because there's some learning that happens along the way when you try to implement it like that from scratch. So the first thing is, uh, what is this authentication thing? And what is the difference between authentication and authorization? Because those are two different things. Uh, I downloaded the guided project, and I make sure that everybody has it, right? I'm still asking this, but I know that by now everybody has the guy that probably installed and ready to go, right? Uh huh. Tell me when you're done. Because we know that every morning in training kit, there's the guy that project there, and we're going to use that for the day. So, uh, well, this is just cloning it and installing the dependencies. And I'm going to add a little notes file here. Because we want to continue to do that, right? Okay. So we have auth. And the world of auth has author authentication and authorization. And the authentication says, you know, answers the question of who is the client for the API, right? Who is the client? That, that's that's the, the, the question that authentication tries to answer. I don't know who you are, tell me who you are. And then authorization answers the question as what can you do? in the API. So one is about identity, right? It's about identity. The other one is about access. What access do you have? Okay. We're going to be working mostly on this one, even though we may see an example of simple authorization. But the, the aim of the week is get you introduced to the authentication portion of it. Uh, all right, here we go. Now it's happening. So what do we have on training kit? Well, on the first day of authentication, we established that we're going to do username and passwords. And one of the things that we need to worry about is how do we store those passwords? This is the first, the first part of it, OK? Um, there's some reading about the way that the workflow works, but we know because we have used <laughs> username and password. So you register for an account and then you can log in. And, and in some cases, you can also log out. So the three things, if we're going to keep users' passwords on our system is how do we store it? How do we control that they have really good passwords? And also, how can we serve safeguard, like protect our API against brute force attacks? You know, some attacker trying to get into our API by guessing passwords from our, from our users, OK? So the first one is, how do we store the password? The first rule is never, never should be plain text. So that leaves us with two options, encryption or hashing. Encryption is a two-way process, meaning that 
if I take a password and I encrypt it, I can always get the password back. And then the other one is hashing, that is supposed to be a one-way process. So if you take a password, you hash it, you never get the password back. At least we think so. It may just be really hard, but we think that we're protected that way. So we're gonna go over under that assumption where everybody believes. So what about, and this is, this is for the storage thing. So we're gonna use hashing instead of encryption because it is a one-way process. So what about the second one, password strength? Well, why is this important? If you go and check this out, this is a nice website. It's, the link is there on Training Kit. That's where I got it from, right? So let me drop it here. But the idea behind this is how secure are your passwords, like your passwords, the ones that you use right now? And uh, they give you a few scenarios or how long would it take for a user to be able to guess your password? And there are um, variables related to that. But the point is you wanna, you wanna kind of nudge or orient your users towards having a really good password. And you, yourself, wanna go after, if, if you're not doing that, you wanna go after this lecture and reset your passwords to be better. Okay, so if you, if you have like password or you have QWERTY, one, two, three, four, that seems like a good, Password, but in reality, this is just guessing from nothing, not taking into account that they have databases of all of these, you know, use passwords. Um, 37 seconds. 37 seconds from scratch to guess that password. So, what you want to do is you want to have a long password. So, no matter what make the password long, okay? And if you add, I have no digits and no uppercases, but if we do add symbols, like other than spaces, like a, like a, maybe a dash, right, instead, and maybe here I have a dot, maybe here I have a comma, but the point is use, use characters, special characters if you can, and also use uppercase and lowercase and digits, okay? But make it long. This is just 38 characters long, and now the numbers from 37 seconds changes a little bit. I have no idea how to write that number, 63.41 million, trillion, trillion, trillion centuries. This is not true, though, because they have been, they have been accumulating passwords over the years, right? And they do divide that work. Uh, so this may not take this long to get to it. And if they already pre-calculated your password, hey, you're... But the idea behind having a long password is you, you want to discourage someone from going after your password. Okay? If you know, if they, if they know that your API requires something that is uh, at least 16 characters long, and there's another one that says, you know, from four to 12 characters long, I, I guess what they're gonna go after, provided they, they'll get the same benefit. Should we learn how to do stuff like brute force attack? No, no, <laughs> this is not a, uh, this is not a, a white, what are they called, white hackers course. This is not a security course. This is an API course. So this is a very gentle introduction. And uh, what you're gonna walk away out, out of this week is with the idea of, um, hopefully I never have to implement one of these things. By default, security is something that is a complete different industry and you should delegate that to the expert. This is for you to get an understanding and be aware that it's important, uh, things like this, like the password length, when you are designing your API and you're telling your users how to use it, okay? But you don't wanna roll your own authentication. You don't wanna uh, try to have your, right, your, your, you know, your own hashing algorithm. Trust that to the expert until you are one. When you are an expert and you become an, a math and you know security expert, then you could go into that. But we're not we're not gonna learn about attacks. I don't know how to do that. I'm not a I'm not I'm not a hacker. <laughs> yeah, my mama one two three might not be safe. Let's try that. Okay. Yeah, one point oh look it showed up in red. I don't know why it showed up in red. But 
just know that there are databases with passwords that are common use passwords, so you want to stay uh, away from those. But even if they have to pre-calculate it by, you know, from scratch, yeah, not not safe. Cool. So how do you defend? Well, you're gonna learn some some guidelines like delegate security to the expert. But if you have to do it, you know, uh, make sure that you tell your users use a long password, make it be complex, and validate that on your API. If someone tries to create a user and they're giving you a password that is too short, you wanna validate that, okay? And you have some suggestions. Of course, that doesn't mean that you're gonna remember the weird string of characters, but by making it really long, even if you are using um, something from a poem that you read a long time ago, so, a favorite quote from someone, okay? So what you do is you mix in a few characters, uppercase, lowercase, and make sure that you don't have your words separated by spaces because here, here's what happens. If you do this, even though it looks like it may take, you know, 20 centers, but if you do this, this is actually one, two, three, four words. And we have a dictionary, okay? So the same way that they combine characters to have, um, because the idea of finding a password is just different combinations of, of the characters, they do combinations of words. So whenever you do this, it is better if you just do that, right? Like this, it's a little shorter, but now this is no longer a word. So it is harder for them to break it up and attack it that way. So there, there is a, every database has an, a main length or a mass length, but you also want to validate it at, at the API level. But the database has, uh, you do have, there is something called a check, a check constraint, and that check can verify the password and say, hey, yeah, not good enough. So you could check against the length and not, and you know, don't let, say, don't let them save anything that is not, Checking. Some databases also have a mean length that you can specify on the string. But I would say check constraint is probably the way to go. Most databases, uh, or all databases, will support it. We haven't talked about salting yet. We're going to get there to that, and then we're going to address that question. Because it, it's going to be confusing now. Now, Long passwords, that's the first one, right? Long passwords. You wanna protect your users, you, you wanna have a minimum length that is long. Like you, you, I don't know what the good size is, but I would say anything below 16 characters, I'm kind of worried about, personally, okay? So that's the second one. The third one is how, how do I protect myself against a brute force attack? So if we go back and we think of this, like hashing is one way. That means, that means that you have a password, you know, plain text, and, and you pass that, you give that to a, it's called a key. Well, if you pass it to a hashing algorithm, right, to the hashing function, it's gonna give you back a hash. And a hash is just a string, right? It's just, it's gonna take a regular password and it's gonna give you back a weird string out of it, okay? That's, that's what a hashing function would do. Now, these hashing functions, they have been around for a while. They were not used for security. They are designed for speed. So they wanna be fast. Now, here's the problem. This is a one-way process, but you, you know about databases now. So you know that you could have a table of, you know, hashes, a hashes table. And this hashes table has an ID but it also has like a password, you know, the algorithm, the number of rounds, we'll see that what that is. And uh, it's got a hash. See what I'm saying? We can write a process that is gonna take a combination of characters, select an algorithm, and a number of rounds, again, we'll see what number of rounds means, and generate a hash, 
And you can run a process 24 seven, just pre-calculating hashes, pre-calculating hashes, pre-calculate hashes. And we know that there is no way from a hash to be able to get the password. But what if I do this? Select from hashes where the hash is this hash I stole from a database. Okay. So given the hash, if I pre-calculate and I fill up a table of all pre-calculated hashes now, I could go and select from that table and I'll get back the password, right? And it's gonna tell me, hey, you use this algorithm with this number of rounds and you will get, and use this password and you're good to go. So there is a way of getting that password back because the algorithms are discrete. There's a certain number of algorithms that people use. So attackers have been building those databases for a very long time since computers started and people came up with the idea of hashing. They have been building that, those databases. So a lot of the passwords that, and when you're like, well, this means that someone stole the database. Yeah, if you go to a website called Have I Been Pwned? And you sign up and you should sign up for their service, they will, they will let you every time your email shows up in one of those breaches. Like latest breaches, look at that, 772.9 million accounts. And what the companies will tell you is, it's okay, I mean, they stole your email and your password, but it's hashed, they can't get your password back. Uh-huh, what about that? What if your password is already one of the, one, one of the, the, the passwords they have pre-calculated? They do a search, your hash shows up, now they have your password. But then again, they will say, well, that's not a problem because you know we, we did some security stuff and they, they're not gonna be able to get into our servers again. Okay, great. But what if some people, I know you don't do this, but some people use the same password in more than one place. And uh, if you use, you know, that forum that you go for, that hobby that you have, what if their security is not as good as you think? And you're like, well, I don't care, because, you know, it's just talking about my hobby. I mean, there's no sensitive information there, but they have, there's a password there. They get into that, they grab your password. They, you have a short password, they pre-calculated that a long time ago, and now they have your password. What if you use the same password for your email? The keys to the kingdom. How do you reset your bank account password? Email. I mean, hopefully you have two-factor authentication where they also send you either a verification code using one of those authenticators, like a like Google Authenticator, or maybe a text message. I hope that you have that on every service that supports two-factor authentication, you want to turn it on. But if some people don't have that, some services don't have to factor authentication either. It's not an easy thing to do. So, yeah, there is always a risk that they grab your password from some place and you have been reusing that password in another place. So it's dangerous. Okay. Greg, I'm not ignoring your... <laughs> Your question. I'm just, we're not there yet. We're going to get there. So, hashing. Long passwords. And you want to encourage your users, like, good password guidelines, please do not sh share this password in other accounts. It's dangerous. And you should be aware of this. So, go and make sure that you have your passwords. You know, they're different on every account. Uh, someone listed a nice service called LastPass. I use I use this one. This is like sixty. I think it's like sixty dollars a year for my whole family. This is called One Password. It's the one that the the guy from Have I Been Pawn. He recommends this. So I started using it, and I'm pretty happy with it. They give you some stories and stuff. If you want to say some, I use it for password generation. 
I no longer share passwords across different accounts. It's been a long time. And not only that, I will generate as long a password as the site will let me. So some of those passwords are really, really long and complex. I'm not gonna remember them, I don't care. I have a super duper long and complicated password to get into, into one password. Now, here's the problem. All your eggs is in a single basket, so if they ever break into <laughs> one password, they got my passwords. That's, there's no way around it. Now, this is one of the two major companies that do this, LastPass being the other one. I am pretty sure that they know more about security or care more about security than most websites that we visit. So i rather have them store my password. How do I make sure the password for the, cap, for the password keeper is safe? It's really long, really complex. It is something that only I know. You will find something like that. There's gotta be something that only you know. From your childhood, from your children, from something that only you know. Conversation that happens sometime during your childhood at a table and you remember that and this is something that stuck with you. You haven't talked about that with anyone. So you make that really long and add characters and separators in there and make it a block of letters. And uh, good luck guessing that one. Okay, it's gonna take trillions upon trillions of years before they get to that one. It's gotta be long, okay? Um, mine is really, really long and one pastor did not complain. He's like, yep, give, it, give me more, give me more. I want longer, longer. Yeah, so there are, there are good extensions and all that. The reason I did not go with an extension is, is because that's, that's gonna limit you to the browser only. So any other, like, and if you are out there, um, this has an application that runs on your mobile too, so that's the only reason. But if you don't have anything, Chrome will generate it for you. And there are extensions that do that. I would not, I would not trust extension probably. I would rather go with a generator from the browser like Firefox or you know, Brave browser or, or Chrome because I kind of trust Google more than I trust a third party extension, but that's just me. Um, but use them. Don't, just don't share passwords across site. That's, that's really important and don't, don't have short passwords. Because chances are, short passwords, they already have a hash pre-generated for that. And it's not a matter of if, it's when they break into, break into a server, they're gonna grab your hash. Like you, you could see, like MySpace, yeah, but LinkedIn, I mean, LinkedIn is a, this is a big deal, 165,000 accounts. Like they go in there, they steal the account, they have your hash, Adobe. There are big names, big people that you would say, no, yes, they have really good engineers, but still they break in there. I mean, how many, 500, 700, I don't remember how many millions of people on the Equifax bridge. I mean, these are people that their whole business model is about guarantee people identity. If anybody gets a hold of your data from a credit bureau, they have enough information to steal your identity. And there was a breach there, and there were no consequences. Oh, great, you gotta give me your service that you sell for a year. But then again, what happened was that the boom, the business of people protecting their identity by paying a service, up the roof when the Equifax thing happened. I think, I think we should have been a little more stern in those companies, right? Again, how do you protect yourself from that? Do the best you can when it comes to your passwords. And anytime you see a, an option to not use or use, not create a brand new account with a username or password, take it. Use your GitHub, use your Google account, use your Facebook account, authenticate with a social media, like anything related to development, I just, if I see it, logging with GitHub, GitHub, of course. That's one less username and password that I have to worry about. That's one less company 
having my information. I am basically trusting GitHub, okay? And anybody else that would let me connect using GitHub, I would just, because that means that I can connect to those services, but the password and the hash is in one place, GitHub. So, again, today, oh, by the way, for the project in the afternoon, it's just the project that we'll be building in the morning. So don't worry too much about the afternoon. Take that time to go and review your front end skills. Go and work on one of those projects that you have been building because you, you have been building projects all along, right? So pick, pick something, do a clone of whatever and go and practice your skills with the extra time that you're gonna have this week because you're going into build week next week. If you still a little, need a little more help with the back end stuff, yeah, go and practice that build a couple of APIs from scratch, add some databases, work on that, because you will have time. Since this is registration and login, uh, well, today is about hashing the passwords, but whatever we do, if you follow along in the morning, that's gonna give you the solution for the afternoon, so just copy that, be done with it, and go and practice. This is a week for you to practice and understand the basics of security, so do that. Um, I see a message about password keep safe. Um, so go on practice. SQL querying, practice, practice, practice. Whatever you feel like you need more practice, but just by try to build a project and you will know where you need a little more practice. Uh, maybe CSS, maybe you want to learn CSS uh, grid. Now's your time. Maybe it's Redux. Now's your time. Maybe you want to go into hooks because you haven't tried that. Yeah, go for it. Query, practice that. Building a project is going to give you the chance to practice all your skills from you know full stack project. Build a, a React application, build an API, deploy the API to Heroku, React application to Netlify, so, so you have them talking to each other over the network. More real world uh, scenario. This is how most applications are built now. They, they're going to be hosted in different places and talk to each other over the net. All right, let's go back here. So how do I, how do I protect myself against that? Well, if we say that we could just regenerate this way, how, how can I do? Well, we add in here, we take this hashing function and we add the concept of time, meaning I'm going to force an attacker, they go into my database and the way that we're gonna generate our hashes, we're gonna force it to be slower. So we wanna, we're gonna add the concept of time. So instead of just having a hashing function, we're gonna have this. Hashing function plus the concept of time in the form of rounds. We'll see that in action in a minute. This is what it's called a key derivation function, but don't worry about it. Just know that we're gonna use a library that is gonna do the hashing for us and they're gonna give us a way for us to slow down the generation of the hash. And what this does is, if I am taking longer to save a user, to register a user, and generate a hash for the user password, whoever tries to regenerate hashes for my system has to go through the same exact process. They have to use the same algorithm that I'm using, and they have to use the same number of rounds, meaning, the same time or at least the same number of times that I rehash the passwords. So what those libraries do, they have they, they do a couple of other things like they concatenate a string to you, but th those are not extra security in the end because when when they grab the hash, they'll be able to see um, how many rounds, they'll be able to see which algorithm was used and they, they will be able to see the, the salt. So at the end of the day, your password, okay, and how many rounds we do is how we slow them from pre-generating, okay? So which function should we use? There are a lot. We picked one called bcrypt.js. It's a JavaScript implementation. Uh, this one, um, because of the way the, the crypto library works, it trims the password to about 72 characters and then it adds something to it. But, so 72 bytes is 
as long as you can get with this, it's, I guess, I mean, there's, there's nothing else. I mean, there are two other upcoming technologies for this, um, but this is by far the most popular. So it's the best we can get, kind of. It's well tested too. So, what else, where else can you get information about security and stuff you wanna read a little more? Well, this, this OWASP top 10 is an open web location security project. It's a good place. This link is on training and I'm gonna post it. You don't have to read it now. But know that they, they kind of collect together Every year, it takes a couple of years for them to publish it, but they collect information about all of the breaches and they say, okay, what was the reason? And they give you the top 10 reasons people get security breaches. The first one is SQL injection. SQL injection attacks, and they, they, if you click on those links, that's gonna take you to how to do it and how it works and all that, right, and some examples. And there is a lot of reading, a lot of more links in there for you to see. but Believe it or not, as of 2017, I think it was the last year that they finished already, SQL injection attack was the number one. The number one reason systems were compromised. Locally, if you're using Kinex, you, you don't have the problem because Kinex protects you against SQL attack like out of the box. Most ORMs of your relational mappers will do. Most libraries will protect you from that. The problem is when you try to concatenate SQL statements by concatenating strings. You open yourself to that. So, uh, broken authentication, and they give you some, some, you know, a list of uh, some explanation of what they are. Some of them may or may not be relevant to us building APIs. Like we don't use XML anymore, so having something like XML external entities is not, yeah. Um, websites may still be vulnerable to that. So read, read about them, right? Broken access control. Uh, if you want to see what. Some companies that have stored passwords in a way that is retrievable, either encrypted or plain text, there is this funny website, and they have examples of them. And there have been people there that you would not think, but they were there. So there's also, this is a project uh, about not using passwords at all. And um, there is a link somewhere in there about 12 practices. On this is, uh, by the way, talks about rainbow tables. And there are 12 practices recommended by, um, by uh, Google for applications. The link is somewhere in there too in one of these days, maybe tomorrow. So there is a lot of reading for you to do, of course, about this. But a few rules would keep you safe. One passwords being one of them. Uh, not starting plain text password, there's another one. So we're gonna use some kind of library that does the hashing for us. Again, we pick this one. And we should probably write a little bit of code so they have the idea, what, how is it that this works? So I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you an exercise. We're gonna start the day in a different way. Let me see if this server runs. I don't remember if this server runs out of the box. So we have a register, login, and all that. Yeah. Um, so what I want you to do is build an endpoint. We're gonna call this hash. So server that, and we can make this be a, a post to hash, okay? And you're gonna read the password from the body. And I pass in a password. But then here, you're gonna hash that password. And then we're gonna do rest that status 200. And you're gonna send back an object that has the password that you got and the hash, okay? So somehow here you're gonna say const hash equals, and here's, here's where the, I don't know, like some kind of hash. This is what we're gonna figure out. USB crypt to generate a hash. Okay. And then you're gonna return the original password that they send you plus the hash so that we could see them. 
Let me give you the, the body for this post. It should be pretty simple. Here we go. Now, uh, npm run server, I guess. Running on 5,000. Of course, if we do that, uh, no call host, we get the hash is empty. So we want to see the hash here as the result. Let's take a few minutes to do that. Don't, don't post it. I mean, if you finish it, just keep it there. So your job is reading through this documentation and see if you can figure out how to hash a password. And then return it. Let's uh, let's take mm, what time is it? Thirty seven. Let's take uh, eight minutes for this.
All right. Such a good exercise, right? This is kind of giving you a peek into the future. You're going to jump into a project and you need to use a library you haven't used before. So what do you do? Well, if you can read it from here and the documentation is good enough, that's, that's going to get you started. All we're doing now is figuring out a way to take in a string. We call it a password, but it's just a string and generating a hash out of that. And there are a few ways of doing this, right? So the first thing is, well, you should probably install BigCrypt.js. Locally, in our project, it's already installed. So if you check out the patches that JS on there, um, BigCrypt.js is in there. Okay, you know how to install that. So now we have that, we need to require it. So let's go, I'm just gonna follow a process of, let me, let me see if this, this documentation can get me somewhere. So I'm gonna copy this and say, okay, I'm gonna grab this, BigCrypt, require BigCrypt.js, let's do that. Of course, at the top of our file here. And this would be bcrypt, bcrypt.js. Okay, got it. All right, what else? What else, bcrypt? Well, not the browser. I'm not gonna be using this in the browser. And there's a couple of usages. I, I can use it synchronously or asynchronously. Um, I tend to just do it synchronously during the demo. But there's an example of doing it asynchronously, right? So you just have this. This is with a callback function. But I think there is a way for doing it with a promises right here. Okay. So let's try the sync one. It says, well, I could generate a salt. Bcrypt has a way for you to generate a salt. Uh, and this is just going to give you a random string. Okay. And then you could just grab the hash this way by passing it the salt. That's one way. And then this is how you compare. Now, there is another way down here that says, I could auto-generate the salt for you, save you this step, and do the same thing without you having to give me that. And then in this case, I'm passing a number here. Hmm, what is that number? All right, let's try this. First, okay, uh, and say, all right, so in order to generate the hash, I'm gonna say, uh, no, not that. Hey, didn't I just copy that thing? Oh, I hit the wrong thing. So I'm gonna copy this, copy, copy, all right. And I'll drop it down here and say, uh, so I'm gonna call bcrypt hash think uh, and hmm, what is this? And what is this number thing? Well, let me see if I can figure that one out. This is not telling me anything. Uh, all right, let's see the API. Oh, okay, set random fallback, get some. That's not what I want. Gen solo, not what I want. Ha hash thing, yeah? That's the one we're using, right? Hash, hash think. Uh, hash, hash sync. Yep, that's the one. So, so this is saying generate a hash for a given string. All right, so the first one, this is the string to hash. So in our example, the string to hash would be the password. Okay, we want to pass it the password. Password. This is the password that we're reading from the body. Excellent. So, uh, but what about the second one? What is the second one? Um, well, we could pause it. We could give it a salt. And if we don't give it one, either a number or a string, then it will default to 10. Hmm. And then it's going to return a string. Huh. Um, this is not as explicit as we want it, but let's go do it. In reality, I don't know why that's not explained closer to the top, but if you keep going, you'll learn about rounds, this, this thing right here. So I'm gonna explain it to you because the documentation is not helping. Like it's not like right at the top of where we should be, right? But there's this thing called rounds. It's the number of rounds used to encrypt a specified hash. And the way that that works is the library will take a value. Uh, let's go into a notes. So it will do this, right? It would take um, like, a, like a string and then hash it, right? To the to the to the hash to the hash function, and it's gonna give you what? It's gonna give you on the other side. It's gonna give you another. It's gonna give you a hash. 
but then it's going to take that and hash it and that's going to give you back another hash and it's going to take that yeah and hash it <laughs> and it's going to give you another hash so the thing is that this hash is based on a hash that is based on a hash of the original string and this is going to happen and this happens to to the to the end and this n is the value that you're passing so that means that if i give it given giving a three this happens eight times but if you give it a four it happens what two by two by two by two by two like what uh 64 times says 16 times i don't i don't know the math but the point is that when you give it a number it's not that it's going to happen eight times it's two to the eighth whatever that number is and it's it's a large number so this is two to the eighth right here so that's what this is talking about uh let me let me say the second number is the is the rounds and those are going to be two to the n right so if we do it with eight uh, let me show you let's just try it out first to see if that works so we're going to send this and oh that did not work because i should think password eh, 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 eh. i should have worked Should have worked, should have worked. Password, password. Ah, why is this, why is this returning on define? Weird. Uh, what? What? Why is this on define? This is missing something. All right, let's try this out. See what's going on there. Ah, yeah, this is why. Because we have an L somewhere in there. Ah, there it is. Yeah, that's not it. That was not it. This is something else. Let's try it out. Okay, send in this. What do we got? Am I not hitting the right endpoint? Why is this not? Updating. See that? All right, let me look at Slack. I'm going to let you. Uh, but what is this? What is this thing? Oh, I think I have like a. Everything inside, everything in there from the moment that we did the paste. Yeah, why do I have all this stuff? Oh. Uh. Ah, the dangers of password and eight the dangers of copy and paste does it like look good now thank you server very much i think password and then eight and we have bcrypt bcrypt js there we go that should have gone faster boom here we go. Now that's what I want to see. I'm going to copy this. And this is what we got from that password. I'm going to copy it in here. All right. And then I'm going to hit it again. And then we're going to copy it again. And this is what we got. Second time around. 
Look at that. They look different. Some part of it is the same, but they look different. So two different hashes generated from the same password. The reason for that is the auto-generating salt. A salt is just another string that is concatenated with your password and then is hashed. Okay, so it's always dynamic. Now, why did I say that? Yeah, that's cool and all, but uh, the library needs a way to go from a, to, to always generate the same hash when you wanna check for a password. Like in this case, I'm like, ah, how do I know that, that, I, that this is the password that I meant? The library has a way that would say, hey, given this password, tell me whether this is the password or not. And the way that it does is it needs to know, you see those values here? This is the number of rounds, see that? Eight rounds. If we change that, let's change that in the code and see what do we get. Let's do, and you see how fast this is done? Watch, boom, boom. Now I'm gonna change that only to 18, right? Make a little change there and look at this now. Uh -huh. See that? So that number is important because that means someone trying to pre-generate hashes that way, the way that we're doing it automatically, has to obey the number of rounds that we have on that hash. When they grab the hash, it's like, okay, in order to get this, I have to have my rounds be to 18. This is way too long, okay? Way too long, at least on this computer. Of course, if you're doing it on a super fast server, maybe maybe not that slow. So maybe a decent number to get started with, depending on the power of your server, is 14. It's gonna take a little bit, but then it's gonna come back. Even 14 is too long, six seconds it took, right? So this is how you slow down attackers, by the number of rounds. You make it so that when they steal your hash, like if they grab this hash, they're gonna be like, okay, this is the algorithm. And this is the number of rounds that I need to use. I can do this because they're gonna be pretty fast. So I could take, now I have the algorithm, remember from the notes, now I have what the algorithm is and I have the number of rounds. I could now start generating hashes using the algorithm of that number of rounds until I find one that is the same, is the, the hash that I got, that I stole from the database. And I'll know what the password is. Now the library, Rainbow Tables uh, have a challenge because the library is now adding a salt, you would say, right? But then the salt is in there. The salt is also part of that hash. So that means that the attacker also has a way. And some companies will generate the hashes themselves, but then they save it in the database. And then at the end of the day, it's like, if they're in there and they can grab the account information, they can also see, they can also see the salt. So at the end of the day, I don't, I don't, I, I know the security experts probably know why that's more secure, but in my mind, what matters is that you have a really secure and long passwords. That's what's gonna slow them down for sure. So this is the key. And also give it as many rounds as you can. So apparently on my computer running Zoom and all that, and my needs a desktop, probably wanna do, I don't know, let's do 12, see if that not, that's not too slow. Yeah, it's decent, but again, look how when we generated that with 12, the 12 is there. So this is telling whoever stole the hash is telling it how many rounds they need to do in order to arrive to this hash. I don't know what the salt is, but it's in there too. So they will, they will have the data that they need. The only thing they're gonna have missing is your password. So short password means easier for them to guess it. So two to the eighth is 256. I, I care. <laughs> so it's not a lot. But two to the 12 is a bigger number, is it? Calculate, uh, yeah, it's probably really.
how did I do it? That's all I did. I just, I'm just passing it as part of the pass a password in the body. Make a JSON. And then I'm grabbing it from the body here. So this is how the hashing process, the hashing part of it worked. If you do it asynchronously, you would say like hash and then that then, and that's where you respond because you have to wait for it. So maybe in production, if you have a lot of people registering, which is weird, but if you did, you would probably want to have this not block everything until the password is done. But this is a process that I think it's a little more critical on the login than it is on the registration. That's it. Now you know how to hash a string. We're going to use it to hash the password before saving it to the database. So we're going to come in here into the register and use that knowledge in order to implement the register and say, hey, before you add the user to the database, please first hash the password. We're going to do that after a five minute break. So let's take five minutes and then come back and do the hashing of the user and implement the registration process using that. So see you in five.
All right. So let's go and do that. Let's go and uh, implement the register. So we want to hash the password here, right? Hash the password. So we use the same code that we use down there. We're going to say const hash. It's going to be equal to bcrypt hash. We could do it hash again. Let's just do it synchronously. It's easier. And then um, what are we passing here? The user that password. Okay. Now we have the hash. So how can how can I make sure that instead of having the password be the plain text, the password is now the hash? How can I do that? And I want this to happen before I do the saving. Well, I don't have a password. We have one down there because we're grabbing it that way, but not here. Yep, that would make sense, right? So I want to make sure that the password for the user becomes the hash. So we're going to say user that password is going to be equal to the hash. Of course, we are not checking for the that, that we have a password, that we have the username. This is validation that must happen. And you probably want to run this in a try catch to make sure that if there are any errors, you can react to them or just do it asynchronously and do it then that catch. But in the simplest form, this is the flow. This is what you're learning. Okay, the flow. And then of course you validate and protect it. Doing this, by the time you save the user, then the user should have in theory, right, should have the password hashed. So let's, uh, let's duplicate this baby here. And this is going to be a post to users to register. And we're gonna pass a username now. Username, student, and the password is going to be Hired. That's a comma. So let's see what we got. Username and password. I'm gonna send this to slash API slash register. Let me, let me double check this. Slash API slash register. All right, all right. Yeah. Save that. Let's go there. Boom. And this is what we expected. And the username and a password that has been hashed. Cool. Let me know when you have registered done. And then we move on to the next step, which is login. Here's the code. What? Everybody's done already? Yeah, so I think you were working on that during the break. Excellent. Everybody's done. So let's go move on to the login portion of it. So when doing the login, all we have to do is verify that. I wonder if we should do an exercise on it and have, let you figure it out, or we could just go and do it together. Let's go in here and say, is there a way for me to check that a password is correct? All right, usage uh, to hash a password. Oh, look at that, to check a password. So we're going to copy this. So we can compare sync or, you know, we have an async usage of this. Just compare and then pass it on either that or do a 
Should we do this one with, this is the login, so let's, let's copy this. I don't know what's going on there. Let's come and see. So compare returns a promise if callback is omitted. So we're going to do it this way. I'm going to say, all right, I'm passing uh, something here. And then the hash. So we'll use this. On login, where can I go? I'm going to drop it here and say uh, const is, is valid. OK. And then what we're passing here is where's the hash going to come from? Where's the hash stored at? Where's the hash at? It's not in the browser. This is not where the hash is going to come from. Where is it coming from? When we're doing a login, we get from the client, what do we get on the body? We're getting the username and password. When they do a login, they send us the username and password in plain text. So that's not what it is. It's not coming from the client. Well, we, what is coming from the client, though, is the password. So we could pass this password here. That's what we want to check. OK? But then the hash, how can I find for that user, where is the hash stored? Where is it kept? So when we did this, we saved this user where? On the database, right? When we raise to the user, we save it to the database, and we save the hash in the database. So this hash should be coming from the database, OK? That means that we can only have access to this hash after finding the user. So this can't be up here. It's got to be somewhere else. So we have to go in here and say, OK, I'm going to look for that user by the username. If I find it, OK, right here, if I find it, then in here, we're going to drop this. We're going to say, mm, let's check if the, this thing is valid. And the way that I check for that is by doing this. But then the hash is actually coming. What would be the, the value of the hash? How can I get to the hash now in here? After I know that I got the user from the database. Yep, it would be the user dot password. So we are going to compare this password coming from the client to the password stored in the database. It is important that they are added in this order. The hash is the second argument. The library is going to take this password, information from the hash, like how many rounds I need to use, what salt am I going to use, what algorithm am I going to use, and it's going to rehash that password. It's going to take this password, apply those parameters, get a new hash, and then compare the two hashes. Do we need to care? No. It's magic. It just works. OK? And then after that, if it is true in here, we can check, OK, in here. And we could check for the response, whether it's valid or not. So since we're using promises instead of async and await, we don't need to capture there because we have access to it here. So this would be is valid.
And now, if it is valid though, this is where we make the decision. I like to write this using, instead of using asynchronous, because it, it's a little kind of weird, I like to simplify it a lot by using the sync function. I say, when you log in, I'm gonna go and check the password, and then I'm gonna let you continue or not, okay? So let me show you a version of that. But I would say, instead, I go and find it. No, once I have it, I check that I have the user, but not only check that I have the user, I check here also, I take this, and compare that right there. And I say, well, if I have a user and, and this would be a compare sync now, so that it waits, and the passwords match, this is gonna return true or false depending on whether the passwords match or not. And this is gonna save me a lot of noise and extra code. That's a simpler version of this. I just wanted to get there so it's not confusing having an inside data. Why does this work? Because this is gonna tell you true if the password stored in the database and the password sent by the client match and if they do great welcome if not i'm going to consider that to be invalid credentials the cool thing about this is if you don't find the user see if you don't find the user you're also going to get invalid credentials that means that an attacker is gonna be left guessing. Is it the username, is it the password? So if you give me a valid username, I still tell you invalid credentials. So you don't know. You don't know whether you have a valid username or not. So to duplicate this to try it out. And then we're gonna say this is gonna be our login. Why is this a post? Because we need to send data in the body. So we change this to be the login. Yeah, welcome. But if um, if I change it to hired, uh, then you get invalid credentials. If all right, welcome. But then students. That means I didn't find the user. Then you get invalid credentials. So it works fine. Catch up, and then we're gonna do another exercise. I mean, you're gonna do one and then you see the solution. Questions about the login, how it works. Here's the key, right there. You let the library check the passwords for you and tell you whether they're, they're the same or not. And when that works, then we're gonna move some of that code out of there and see if we can find a way to reuse that. Okay, uh, looks like everyone's good to go. Excellent. So I have an exercise for you. The exercise is find a way, like here it is. We have the we have the users. Let's go and visit that endpoint there. I'm gonna make it be a get. Oh wait a minute! I think I have that already. So let's uh, let's use this one. Let's see. Get users. Yeah, I think this works. Only need to change the port. Here we go. Yep, excellent. So we have this endpoint, and you can visit that endpoint whether you have password or not. So you can always visit that endpoint. I want I want you to figure out a way to restrict this, like. can only be accessed by, by clients with valid credentials. 
find a way to restrict that. And then I want to have another endpoint. Let's see, we have another endpoint. Yeah, this one right here. So both endpoints. have the same requirement, right? We, we can definitely go now to the root, yeah, it's live, and we can go to the users. And I wanna protect those endpoints, those two endpoints, only clients with valid credentials. Mind you though, they are get requests, so you can't really rely on reading password from the body. You have to read the password from someone else. We have seen ways of doing that. I'm gonna tell you right now, do not do it on the URL because you don't wanna have a password on the URL. So do not do it as a parameter on the URL and do not do it as a query string parameter because it's the same, it's gonna be on the URL. You don't want the password there. So look for the other alternative that is not the body, query stream parameters or URL parameters. And that's how you want to read the password. And make sure that you filter this so that only when they provide a valid password will you let them access those two endpoints. Go. That's the exercise right there. And by the way, this is login. This is how you compare. And so may, may be useful to check for the password. Let's do, do a little longer here. What time is it? Yeah, we have time.
Oh, the excitement is overwhelming. I mean, I would play the banjo or something, but I don't play anything. That would be Josh. All right, I need a tribute. A tribute to help me out with this. Someone to walk me to this process. Don't worry, we'll, we'll work on it together. All right, so Greg is telling us that we should probably use the headers, okay? And then we want to have that for both. Um, so this is something that I want to reuse for more than one endpoint. What should I create for this? Middleware. Yeah, let's create a middleware. So it's a function. OK, and then uh, next, cool. And then we want to use that here, restrict it, and down here. All right, all right. So we have our middleware function. It's not doing much now, but I want to call next right away. I want to make sure that I don't forget to call next because I want it to continue, but only if the password is valid. So we need to read stuff from the headers. Um, uh, we want to read the password from the header. So actually, we want the whole credentials from the header, right? We want to check the username and the password, both. So uh, we probably just want to copy this. Same thing that we have here. Only that it's coming from the headers this time, right? So we grab the username and password. Instead of the body, it's going to be from the headers. All right. That's good. That's good. But now we need to check we need to go and get the user and all that. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that what we're doing here in the login? Yeah, let's, let's grab this. Just kind of borrow that and drop it in our middleware here. Okay, we got that. Look for the user by the username. If we find it, then we check. And if it's good, instead of returning right away, what is it that we want to do instead? If the password is good, we want to let them continue. So this is where this line goes, right there. If not, we're just going to return from the middleware. You never make it to the endpoint because we're going to tell you, nope, not good. All right. I think we have our middleware. Let's try it out. Let's see. Hmm. What did I fail on? Oh, look at this. Uh, internal error. So this is bad. And this is basically because we're not passing any data, right? We're not checking that we have the headers before we try to find something by, the, by an, an invalid username. So we need to check. We need to check that we have that data before we go for the database. Okay. We we haven't been doing that. We didn't do it because I know we're gonna get to this point, right? So we're gonna do it here. So actually, I, I want to make sure that I have it, right? So I'm gonna say if username and a password. If I have them, if I have some data coming into the headers, then I'm gonna do all of that stuff. Else, I'm going to send back a message, a status, but only that this is going to be your fault. So I'm going to give you a 400 and tell you, uh, hey, client, uh, please provide cr valid credentials. All right? So give me that. I'm not going to tell you what they are. If you don't know, yeah, you shouldn't be using my system. But the point is, I'm going to check that I have a username and password before I try to go and look for anything in the database. If you're not giving me the, da the data on the headers, why bother, right? So now if we go back, we hit that. Ah, yeah, give me, give me some credentials. So we, we want a username. So I click on the headers here, have a username. Um, I, think, I think we said student, right? So the question was, is it a string or not? Well, everything that you pass in the headers is going to be a string, so you don't have to wrap it. This is not a JSON object. 
This is just a string. So you just have the value there. And then on the other header would be the password and uh, is hired. So let's try it. Aha, that works. Uh, what about invalid password? Exactly what we wanna see. Invalid username, exactly what we wanna see. There you go. So simple, just make sure that you have the username and the password and the headers. Okay, so the next step would be, we probably don't wanna have this here, right? So we're gonna cut this out of there. Cut it out and then just have it somewhere in here that makes sense. Maybe a folder that says auth and then we have our middleware in there, restricted, restricted middleware. And then drop that in there. And uh, what we wanna do is export that function. So, and this is gonna need a few things, like it needs the users, it needs to be crypt. So we may need to borrow some stuff from our index. Uh, one letter. So let's go into the index, borrow some code. Like we need, we know that we need to be crypt. Let's go grab it. We also need the users. Here we are. Boom. Gonna grab that too. Only that I need to get out of the auth folder and then go into the users and grab the users model. Now we have that. What else do we need here? Um, okay, once we have that, then we're gonna module that export. Uh, restrict the middleware and that's that's what we're exporting since we know that that's the only thing that we're exporting we could probably just do that right export this function we restrict it you don't need the name but it's good because that way it shows up on the stack for the errors it's going to tell you the name of the function there so let's leave it in there what else do we need uh the headers are good uh, we need users, we need be crypt. I don't think we need anything else. I think we're good to go, right? So now we have that middleware and we are exporting that middleware. So we could come in here and bring it in. Say, rem restricted. It's now going to come from this file called, uh, um, this is inside of the auth folder, restricted middleware. There you go. Good, good, good. And now we can use it there. Excellent. Probably remove all this. This is clear what it's doing. There you go. Let's try it out. Still works. Uh, this is the list. Pass an invalid password and still blocks it. Excellent. All good. Questions there. Okay, no questions. Great, so let me know when you have this working, separate it into its own file. Let me know when you're done, please. Oh, <laughs> restricted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go fix this. Restricted. There you go. Better. Got lost with a username and password. How? Now let me let me do a quick review. We are grabbing the username and password from the headers. That's the only change that we have from the login. Login, we're re reading it from the body because it's a post. We're sending it there. In this case, the only thing that changed is that we're reading from headers instead. Oh, you're having an error. Okay, so 
you know, you know how we do. We tackle it together. Mob programming. I know what it is though. It's a typo. <laughs> it's always a typo. Now we just need to find it. Was it was it working? Uh, you can talk to us if you want. Was it working when it wasn't a single file? Did it break when you moved it outside or was never working? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Sorry. All right. So I, I put everything in the file. Uh-huh. And I got it to there. But I saw that you passed in the password, the username and password to be able to get a response. Yes. That's where I got lost at. In the headers. You're reading it from the headers, not from the body. Okay. So in your so I had to put I had to put in the username and password. In but in the headers. Go back to uh what do you call that? Insomnia. In the headers. You see you're you're in the pat in the body, you want to go to the headers. There you go. Okay. So I'll just put in username. No username. You can have to give it a name. Duh. <laughs> And then okay. whatever, yeah, and then the username that you used when you register the user. Okay, that's what I have to check. That's where I got lost at. Uh, check okay. out your post. Oh, you're, you do have a post, right? Yeah, I think so. The post is right here. No, the, the post that you did on Insomnia. Okay. No, that's that's what I have to do. I have to do the post on Insomnia. On the on register, right? So you need to register and you, you're gonna use the same credentials in order to log in. Okay, so register. But don't change it there because that's a get. Create a new one because that way you could keep a history of, of all of them. Okay, so I, I just changed this one. Slash API slash register. Slash API slash register. And then go back and put username and password. Mm -hmm. No, that didn't work. That's it. Okay. Now to the get. Forgot which one I did. Maybe at the top. Anyway. <laughs> so use a get on five thousand and change that. And then pass in that username and password and JSON. On, on the headers, not in the on body. The headers, on there, the headers. There is no body. Yes. Username.
Yeah, you have credentials. Maybe you're not using the same credentials that you were using. Okay. Oh, it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. So that means that at least that part of it is working. <laughs> and we were doing a get. Now, now you know why. Every time I do that, I create a new one and I rename it. I definitely do. Yeah. I definitely do. Thank you very much. So that which means I think if that part works, then this part should work. Ugh. Still got to figure it out. Okay, I'm gonna figure it out. But I think you got it. Got me to the point where I need to understand. Thank you. Well, cool. Thank you very much. Yep. No problem. Okay. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna give you an exercise for the afternoon. Well, we'll wait. We'll do it tomorrow, I guess. We have we have time tomorrow. We're gonna to work on uh, sessions and cookies. So please go watch the videos and read the material on training kit. And again, if you have been following along, the exercise in the afternoon is the only thing that we haven't seen yet. The exercise in the afternoon project. It's a two-day project for you. So your job is implement, see, register, login, and then the user's endpoint, okay? It's empty, you're gonna implement them from scratch. Um, and then you're gonna get to the point where we are today. But then tomorrow, we're gonna implement sessions and cookies and you're gonna come back and finish the project, implementing sessions and cookies. Because the way that it is set up right now, if a user goes to your API, they can send username and password, but the, the server does not remember who they are. So there is no way for them to stay logged in. And that's what we're gonna learn tomorrow. So the your exercise is, this is why I said, the code for the project in the afternoon is, if you follow along, is the code for the project in the morning. So use that, use that learning. If you wanna re-implement it from scratch, yeah, go ahead and do it, of course. But I would say um, it should happen fairly fast. So you may have a couple of hours left for you to uh, go and review and practice a little more. So do that, please. Okay. Uh, if you if we're okay to stay late, will you go over cookies today? No, no way. We 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 try that. We evaluate it. Try to cram everything on a single day, and it's it's gonna feel rushed. Um, it it takes a little more time. So we'll do it tomorrow. We'll be okay. So did we miss where we went over salting? Yes, you did. <laughs> we talked about it and I think I even mentioned uh, your name. Why does the, the length of the password matter if we are adding a random string? It matters because when, when you do the, re remember that we, we looked at the keys there, part of the information that you get back includes the salt because the library needs to know what the salt is in order to generate the exact same hash and verify it. So at the end of the day, the algorithm is not protection because it's revealed here. The number of rounds is not protection. The salt is in there somewhere. So you having it generate a salt randomly is not gonna protect you. What protects you is having a really long password because everything else is part of this hash already. So the attacker has access to it. I mean, if they never get to your hash, great. Then the salt helps there. What I am talking about is once there is a breach and they grab your hash, at that point, the salt is not, is not going to save you. Because they're going to take all of those parameters, including the salt that they have there in part of, as part of the hash, and they're going to start generating hashes, generating passwords using those parameters. The key for you is the longer your password is and the more complex it is, the longer it's going to take for them to get to that number of characters. I, I bet you 
that when an attacker is trying to do that, like they, they really want to get in here and they have the hash and there's like, okay, I have all the parameters. All I'm missing is the password. I'm going to write an algorithm to go through all of the characters. I'm pretty sure they're not going to try to do that with, you know, 120 possible combinations of all of the possible characters. They're going to go after the low hanging fruit, which is people creating 10 letter passwords or 12 character passwords or 16 character long passwords. Those are the victims. Those are the ones that they're going to get to right away. If yours is 85, eh, yeah, they're not going to do that. Too many permutations of it. Okay. So salt is not a substitute for a long password once a breach occurs. So long passwords. <laughs> Good question, though, and it's good that you asked it again. Righty then, go implement it from scratch. See if you can do it from memory. Just looking at the documentation without checking out the code. If you get stuck, check out your code. Get it done. See if you can get it done before the second hour, and then practice, practice, practice. Work on a project, a project. Go build something, whatever you know. Recipe, to-do list, whatever but just work on a project, building a project. You have this week to practice and practice and practice. See you on Slack. Have a good one.